We sing around the throne eternal. When we join the chorus of Pernal. When the saints will ever be happy. to take a hymnal, turn to page number 188, at the cross as we stand. If you'll step up here and have prayer with us, we're glad you're here. We welcome each and every one of you today to the house of the Lord. We do have some sickness that folks called and they're not able to be here. Others have been around, you know what, and that's the COVID. And so now they've got to go get tested, stuff like that. But uh, hopefully nobody will be positive. We haven't heard of any of our folks being positive as of late, all right? So we thank the Lord for that. And we want to welcome our visitors today that are first-time visitors, a precious young lady all the way from Lynchburg, Virginia. Glad you're here. God bless your heart. We'll make her feel welcome in just a little bit. All right, Brother Philbeck, pray with us if you will, please, sir. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for yet another wonderful day, Lord, to be in your house. We thank you, God, for the Sunday school hour. Thank you, God, for your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. We ask God that you bless us today. Be with us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to turn our hearts and our attention toward your word, Father, and pr praise your name, God. That's what we're here to do, Father, and we thank you, God, for a good house of worship that we can come to. We can praise you and honor you, Father. We thank you for the visitors that are here. Please make them feel at home, God. Help them, Father, to just love you and honor you. Let them know, Lord, that they're welcome here. We thank you, God, again for letting us all be here today. We pray for all the ones who are sick, God. Be with us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to praise you like we should, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. you. may be seated all over the building. I want to welcome Dr. Love and glad he's able to feel better to be in God's house. I want to welcome uh, uh, Miss, uh, Miss Todd's mama right here in the middle. I know you've been very sick. Glad you're better. God bless your heart. Others have been out. My wife is out because of a shot reaction, but hopefully she'll be better and maybe tonight or tomorrow, and we sure pray so. But again, thank you for coming, all of you, here to the house of the Lord. I want you to remember Wednesday night service is 730 and then next Sunday morning, of course, and then Sunday night, we're going to have the deacon ordination service for Brother Trey Humphreys. And also, we're going to go over to the fellowship hall, and there'll be a shower for Miss Jana Cudd. That's a bridal shower. And so uh, all the information is there in the bulletin. If you would like to help out with the uh, soups or sandwiches or any of those kind of things or whatever, 
Uh, we, we'd take anything. You just see Miss Malia, and we'll greatly appreciate that. We'll, we normally do that at the shower, but we're going to combine the Deacon Ordination Fellowship as well. So all that's happening next Sunday night, all right, if you'll keep all that in mind. Then I want to congratulate the uh, varsity girls basketball team. They went all the way to Winston-Salem, North Carolina yesterday, and they were able to uh, come off victorious and, and be the champion of the, uh, of the CSAA uh, division or whatever, of the conference. And so let's give them a great big round of applause, all right? <laughs> varsity girls, that's two, I, think that, I think that's two years in a row for the varsity girls. And so that's great, good stuff, all right? Let's have the ushers come on down. We'll get the regular tithe and offering. Please get a bulletin about the uh, baby bottles, about the directories, everything's in there that you might need to uh, be, uh, be informed about, and we'll greatly appreciate you doing that, all right? You give today. God bless you. While the choir sings, you worship in your giving, all right? the offering. Miss Faye Deal, that's your name. I got it right now, okay? You're, 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 you're not just Todd's mama, you're Faye Deal, isn't that right? I got it. See, nobody had to tell me either, all right? All right, Brother David's going to pray for us and dedicate the offering. Lord, we love you today. Thank you for the blessings you've given us, dear God. Lord, let's be able to go to work, Lord, and make money to support the church, right, dear God, right. support our families, right. dear Thank God. Lord, God. thank you for the help, dear God, that we have. You. Lord, you blessed this church more abundantly than any I know of, dear God. Lord, you took care of us health-wise and financially, Lord, we love you and praise you for it. Lord, help the man of God as he preaches today, Lord, loose his mind, loose his tongue, let him say what needs to be said. Lord, it's some lost soul here get saved before it's everlasting too late. Somebody's back so they get closer to you, dear God, like they need to be, dear God, Lord. Use this church in a mighty way, Lord, to touch people's lives. This is my prayer. Amen.
to take a hymn, let's turn to page 473. First and last, victory in Jesus. As we stand, the choir come down on the last. We don't have to shake hands, but I want you to make our visitors feel welcome, all right? Make them feel welcome. Our singers are getting ready, and while they're getting ready, I want to say a word publicly to of uh, thanks and appreciation to uh, Representative Brother Josiah Magnuson and Brother Stephen Long. They're both here, and uh, one of them, of course, a member here. We're kind of working on the other one, but anyway, uh, glad they're here. And just recently, these men were very, very uh, involved and very, very responsible for the heartbeat bill and then the abortion legislation, I hope I'm getting all this right, that Governor McMaster signed into law, and so uh, protecting the uh, life of the unborn. How many believe today that, uh, that life begins at conception? Conception, amen, conception. And so they believe that, and so 
sweeping legislation, but then, of course, the next day, the courts, some judge, you know, probably on the far, far, far left, they, they already canceled that out. It's just pitiful, friend. Take one step forward and two steps backward. But uh, I appreciate these guys being involved, being on the forefront of the battle. And uh, if, you, if you're ever interested in seeing some of this, go on some of their websites and pull up the video and listen to what they actually say in front of their uh, constituents and colleagues. Very impressive, very, very impressive. And uh, I was tickled to death to say, thank God they go to our church, amen. They go to our church, and I'm glad they do. Pray about all that, and if you're here today and you've got a baby in you, then God did that for you. God did that for you, and nobody in this world has any right. You have no right. You have no biblical right. You have no moral right to terminate that child. I still believe it's murder, friend. I really do. Amen. That's not the message, but that's good preaching, all right? Come on, guys. When I think of where I came from and how Jesus brought me out from a life of shame and sorrow, lost in sin without a doubt, with all my heart I want to praise Him for the love He gave to me. When the precious hand of Jesus reached way down and lifted me. Oh, from the depths of the pit, I tried so hard, but I couldn't touch him. There in my despair, I cried so loud, but yet it seemed he didn't hear me. I was so lost and undone, full of sin and so corrupt. But thank God, can reach further down than I could reach up. Oh, like a man locked up in prison with no one to go my bail. Every time I sought for freedom, all endeavors they only failed. There I was in sin's dark dungeon, bound in chains of misery. Oh, but then my Lord, he paid me a visit, unlocked my cell, and he set me free. Oh, from the depths of the pit, I tried so hard, but I couldn't touch him. There in my despair, I cried so loud, but yet it seemed he didn't hear me. I was so lost and undone, full of sin and so corrupt. But thank God's hand reached further down than I could reach up. From the depths of the pit, I tried so hard, but I couldn't touch him. There in my despair, I cried so loud, and yet it seemed he didn't hear me. I was so lost and undone, full of sin and so corrupt. But thank God's hand reached further down than I could reach up. That song been around a long, long time. Guess what? It never gets old. Amen. Amen. I want to thank Brother David Stay. Been working on the uh, enlarging the cemetery. This is a gloomy announcement, really, but it's, I mean, it's going to be glad. But uh, thank you for working on that, digging up asphalt, enlarging the the space availability of the church cemetery. So let's get it. We're going to get it dirt. We're going to get it sown. We're going to lay it out. We're going to lay it out. And see, I've already got men working on that. Even this morning, they did that, uh, measured, 
and we're going to see how many extra spaces we have before we make them available, because when we do, I know they're going to go quick. Everybody's dying to get in there, amen? Yeah. <laughs> I, I told you I was going to try to make it glad. I was going to try to make it glad the best I could. I'm not making light, but uh, we have a cemetery back there, and uh, we're, making, we're making more provision for the Mountain View Baptist Church congregation. So don't, don't ask yet. Let us get it completely finished, find out how many lots are going to be available, and then we'll get a, a sheet or line up or sign up or whatever we need to do, all right? This is Cam Smith's family. Thank you very much. You say amen to that? Appreciate the song. Take your Bible, everybody, and I hope you have a copy of God's Word. I want you to go to the minor prophet by the name of Jonah, chapter number 1 and chapter number 2. I trust you'll follow along with us in the Scriptures as we endeavor to bring God's message this morning to God's people and God's church, all right? Jonah chapter 1, Jonah chapter number 2. I want you, if you will, to start with the preacher today. In verse number 17 of chapter 1, the Bible said, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Do you believe that today? I want you to take your Bible and go to Matthew chapter number 12 just for a moment. Matthew chapter number 12 as we... Uh, take a uh, side route just for a second or two. And I want you to look, if you will, in verse number 39. Matthew 12, verse 39. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And there shall no sign be given it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly... So shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The first thing the Lord did in this passage of Scripture, He authenticated and verified by the Galloway the story and the historical reality of the events of Jonah's life. But secondly, the Lord Himself unfolds for you and I a marvelous, typical line of truth that is set forth in the Old Testament. And that is, Brother Kyle, that Jonah's experience is absolute sober history. We have the Son of God's word for it in Matthew 12. And but the entombment of Jonah in the great fish and the subsequent deliverance of Jonah were intended as a sign, as a miracle, as a token. And that sign or that token was, it was to represent in symbolical form the death and the resurrection 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he verified the history of Jonah, and he also put a stamp of approval by saying that what Jonah experienced is a symbolic representation of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe that is right. Now go back to Jonah chapter number 2, if you will. Now let's read this. Chapter 2 and verse number 1. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord, his God, out of the fish's belly, and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord. And he heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I, and thou heardest my voice, for thou hadst cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remember the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. But I, Jonah, will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And the, and the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. I'm going to stop reading there, but I am interested today in the great declaration, yea, the confession that is found in verse number 9, that salvation is of the Lord, all right? And I want you to know today that this is a minor prophet, but let me say this is a major declaration that salvation is of the Lord. I have two things that I'd like to share with the congregation this morning. Number one, I want to talk about the singularity of deliverance. The singularity of deliverance. In other words, salvation is a word for deliverance. We know it as deliverance from the penalty of sin and from the power of sin. And one day, thank God, from the very presence of sin. But here Jonah, no doubt, is speaking in physical terminology about deliverance or salvation is of the Lord. But I tell you, what else he probably had in mind? And he said that I'm going to pay that that I have vowed. You know what I believe, Brother Kirkland? I believe he's saying to God, you give me another chance, I'm going to keep my promise. I'm going to go to Nineveh. I'm going to return to Nineveh. And I'm going to declare what they saith the Lord. And what I'm going to declare is that salvation is of the Lord. And if you look at chapter number 3 and verse number 1, the Bible said, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it, preach unto it. Verse 3, so Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. I know he went with a message of judgment. I know he went with a message of chastisement. But in chapter number 2, Brother Landon, he said salvation is of the Lord. No doubt, Brother Randy, he declared that message unto the Ninevites. And by the way, he declared it to the Ninevites. I want to declare it to this congregation. I'd like to declare it to the Spartanburg County. I'd like to declare it to the state of South Carolina. I'd like to declare it to the United States of America that salvation is of the Lord. And I'm glad I can tell you that. 
I'm glad we believe that. I'm glad we teach that in Sunday school. I'm glad we preach that at the 11 o'clock hour. What do you mean salvation is of the Lord? Well, that means it is wholly His. It belongs to Him so that none can share in bestowing it. And none can have any hope but save from Him. And none can earn. And none can marry but their salvation. You can't work for it. You can't earn it. Hey, friend, you and I don't deserve it. The salvation is of the Lord. Amen. I stand up here today before this congregation, and I could say honestly, and I could say thankfully that I have experienced the singularity of the Lord's deliverance. I look back at my life. As a 16-year-old boy, there was nothing I could have done to save myself. There was nothing I could have earned, nothing I could have given. And there are no works that I could have amassed. Could I tell you today that salvation is not in your works, amen? And salvation is not in your religion. And salvation is not in your denomination. And salvation is not in the baptismal waters. A matter of fact, but salvation is not in the ordinances. And salvation is not in the sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church. But salvation is not in Mountain View Baptist Church. But salvation is not in Calvary Baptist Church. But salvation is not in Gateway Baptist Church. I'm here to declare today of the same thing that Jonah declared, that salvation is of the Lord. Amen. Amen, everybody. He owns it. He alone bestows it. He alone gives it. It comes from nobody but him. Acts chapter number 4 and verse number 12, Brother Freeman, it said, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. I'm going to be as kind as I know how to be and as loving and long-suffering as I can, I can even verbalize. But can I tell you today, it's Jesus or it's hell. Amen. It's, it's Christ alone. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. On Christ I stand. On Christ I depend. On Christ I rely. How can I tell it like this? If I go to hell, I'll go to hell but trusting in the shed blood. I said I'll go to hell but trusting in the blood. But salvation is not in any person. But salvation is not in any religion. But salvation is not any work of the flesh. But salvation is of the Lord. Amen. Jonah found that out. Jonah experienced that. Romans chapter 1 and verse number 16 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Titus chapter 2 and verse number 11 said, For the grace of God hath appeared to all men, bringing what? Salvation. I don't know what people have been listening to, Miss Krista, all of their life. I don't know what radio preacher or what televangelist or what denomination they've been listening to, but if you add anything to grace, uh, you are subverting the grace of God. If you take anything away from grace, you are subverting the grace of God. Hey, friend, if you make it to heaven and I make it to heaven, it's going to be caused be because of the Lord Jesus Christ and him alone, amen, and him alone. You agree with that today? Salvation is, look at the verse, verse number nine. Salvation is 
of the Lord. I call that the singularity of deliverance. The sing somebody said, somebody said, uh, by the way, it was error when they said it for the eye of his truth that all roads lead to heaven. That's absolutely not true. That is absolutely a contradiction of the revealed, inspired word of God. All roads, thank you, do not lead to heaven. I said all roads. Somebody said, well, it doesn't matter if you're a Presbyterian. It doesn't matter if you're a Methodist. It doesn't matter if you're a Church of God. It doesn't matter if you're a Baptist or a Seventh-day Adventist or a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness, uh, there's something good in all of those. Uh, so it doesn't matter what people is as long as they go to heaven. Could I tell you something? You can be a Seventh-day Adventist and die and go to hell. You can be a church of God and die and go to hell. You can be an independent or a Southern Baptist and die and go to hell. You can be a Methodist and die and go to hell. You can be a Catholic and I'm dying, go to hell. Our salvation, hey friend, salvation is not in a denominational label. I need to preach this. It's not found in a denominational label. You'll never, no matter what a label you assume, it's not your salvation and it's not your security, amen. The Bible said that salvation is of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Who, who saved you? Well, it wasn't my mom. It wasn't my dad. It wasn't the preacher. It wasn't the Sunday school teacher. It wasn't the choir leader. Who saved you? Jesus saved me. And by the way, he keeps me saved. He keeps me saved. Years and years ago, we took a course in the Bible College in Mulberry, Florida, Spurgeon Baptist Bible College. It was called Evangelism Explosion by Dr. James D. D. James Kennedy, who was Anita Bryant's pastor, uh, Coral, Coral, Coral Riz, in way down in South Florida. But he wrote a good book on Evangelism Explosion, and they tried to walk you through the course. And here's what they would ask you to talk to somebody at their door, Brother Newsom. And you was, should, should have said, as the Lord would lead you, if you were to die today and stand before God, why should he let you into my heaven? Now think about that. If you were to die today and stand before God and God were to say to you, why should I let you into my heaven? You know what? You'd be surprised at the answers that people would give. Well, I've been good. Hey, friend. I want to tell you about your goodness. Salvation is of the Lord. Well, I've been moral. I want to tell you about your morality. Salvation is of the Lord. Well, I joined the church. I want to tell you about your church. Salvation is of the Lord. Well, I've kept the Ten Commandments. I've kept the Ten Commandments. I want to tell you something about your law keeping. Salvation is of the Lord. Amen. Are you getting what I'm trying to say? Am I making my point clear? Am I preaching it accurately? Uh, there is no salvation apart from Jesus Christ. Amen. Not only do you have, in Jonah chapter number 2 here, not only do you have a singularity of deliverance, but then secondly, I want to talk to you about the severity of distress, the severity of distress that Jonah was in. Let's start in verse number 2. Look in verse number 2 and said, I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me, watch what he said, out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. But look back to verse number one. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God. Watch what he said, Brother Landon. Out of the fish's belly. Now stay, pay attention right here, everybody. Here's what he's saying physically. This is what he's saying physically. I'm offering prayer out of the gut, out of the abdomen, out of the stomach. 
of the great fish, the whale, Matthew 12. But in the very next verse, he's referring to it entirely different. He doesn't call it out of the fish's belly, but instead he said, I've cried out of the belly of hell. Now listen, that Sheol of the Old Testament and Hades of the New Testament, that's the place of departed human spirit. Stay with me, okay? Now, there are people that write books that are a lot smarter than I am, and many believe that Jonah actually died here, and his spirit or soul went to Sheol, or to the lower parts of the earth, of paradise, before Christ separated paradise, the Hades and Sheol, Hades of the New Testament. But nonetheless, I'm not going to argue whether or not he died or he didn't die or, Brother Kyle, whether or not his soul was separated from his body, it could have very well been. And that's why in verse 1, he's praying from the fish's belly. But in verse 2, he said, my prayer is not just from the fish's belly. My prayer is from the belly of hell. Are you getting this, amen? Are you listening to the preacher today? I just want to tell you, I know it might be conjecture to some degree, but it is very possible that his soul was separated from his body and there he was. We're talking about Sheol of the Old Testament. It's called the grave. Brother Perry, it's called the place of departed human spirits. We know it is paradise in the Gospel of Luke. We know it is Hades in Luke chapter 16. And paradise at one time, stay with me, was in the heart of the earth. Amen. Abraham's bosom side and the side of torment. And Jesus, after his resurrection, I mean, after his resurrection, I took the good side of paradise, led captivity captive, and took them to the very presence of God. Am I preaching it right? And I believe that's where Isaiah comes in, where it said, Hell hath enlarged itself. It enlarged itself, Brother Derry, when Jesus took paradise and moved it to the very presence of God. And now the Bible said, Miss Jada, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But I'm saying to you today, it is possible that many authors that I read after, Brother David, say that there was a separation of Jonah from his body and soul, and body was suffering in the whale's belly, but there was a tie that soul or spirit I wound up in Sheol in the place of hell, and I'm not even dealing uh, with God dealing with the chastise and the corrected prophet. That's for another day, all right? He was a believer. That's for another day. But it's not, it's not insignificant, and it's not strange, and it's not hurting the Scripture to leave it like it is and preach it just like it is and that's what I intend to do and I'm saying to you today that his prayer said I'm praying from the very belly of hell. Look at verse 2 if you doubt the preacher. Look in verse number 2 and said I thank you brother Stoltz I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord and he heard me out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. I never saw this till recently, but in verse 1, he said, I'm crying out of the fish's belly, out of the fish's belly. But in verse 2, I'm crying out of the belly of hell. Here's my thought today. Here's what I want to share with this congregation. Either way you want to dissect it, either way you want to teach it or preach it, we're not going to argue. We're not going to split hairs. We're not going to fall out with each other. Either way, you want to accept it. But my point today is that in some way, shape, or form, you know what Jonah is experiencing and what Jonah is, is involved in? A severity of distress. A severity. Listen, that well was his tomb. I say amen. Amen. That well was, see, I, I don't have all day. I don't have all day. That well was his grave. The word Sheol is literally the grave. 
the part, the, the place of departed human spirit. And so my point and emphasis that I'm trying to make to you today uh, by way of an evangelistic application that nobody's ever going to turn to God. Nobody will ever turn to God until you see the severity of the distress that you are in. And Brother Ivester, it's as if, it's as if that Jonah is on the very cusp or the very brink of hell itself. He said it, I didn't say it. He said, I'm praying. I'm calling on you from the very belly of hell. Would you say amen to the scripture? And so I say to you today that evangelistically, this is a great, great application, a great text to preach to lost sinners. And if you're in this building today, I want you to understand, number one, the singularity of deliverance. Salvation is of the Lord. But I want you to understand also the severity of of the distress that you're in, all right? You say, well, and I need to preach, and I want you to pray for me, all right, that God will turn me loose and let me preach something that I haven't preached in a long time. You know what that is? That hell is real, friend. Hell is real. It doesn't matter what Spielberg says. It doesn't matter what Hollywood says. It doesn't matter what theologians say. Brother Galloway, it doesn't matter what dark Bible deniers, the atheist and the agnostic and the infidel. It doesn't matter, Dr. Lye, what they declare. My Bible says, my Bible says that the rich man died and in hell he lift up his eyes. By the shield of the Old Testament and Hades of the New Testament. And I want to tell you, if you're not a believer, if you've never been saved by the marvelous, matchless, wonderful grace of God, it's as if that you are on the very brink of plunging off into hell itself. Thank God I'm glad we don't have to go to hell. And I'm glad, Brother Adam, we're not going to hell. I couldn't go to hell if I wanted to. Why? Because Jesus saved me. And Jesus has secured me. And I'll never taste the wrath of God in hell. Oh, but isn't it sad? Isn't it sad that multitudes are going to perish and multitudes are going to die without Christ, without salvation? And Brother Trey, when they die without Christ and they die, without salvation, they're going to wake up in hell, friend. They're going to wake up in hell. The severity of the distress. Oh, friend, do you think about it often? Or just when somebody preaches about it? Do you think about it when somebody else makes a profession? Do you think about it when you go to a revival meeting? Do you think about it when some of your family passes away? Do you think about it when you're beside the grave? Do you think about it when you're called to get around the bedside of a hospital bed and your loved one's fixing to leave this world? Is that the only time you think about it? You should think about it all the time if you're not saved because hell is going to be your home. Hell is going to be your eternal damnation. Hell is going to be your eternal destination. Could I tell you something, dear friend? Hell is more than a curse word. Hell is more than slang vernacular. It's more than slang vernacular. And you know what? And you know this is the truth. And if you say amen, you won't hurt my feelings. You won't hurt my feelings one bit. You know it's been a long time since I preached on the subject of hell. I don't know why, Brother Randy. I just never have in a while. But I am here to do it today. I'm here to do it today. Jonah said, I cried out of the belly of the whale. But he also said, I cried out of the belly of hell as if his spirit or soul was separated from his body. And by the way, some believe he did die. And if that's the truth, if he did die, then what a marvelous time of the death, burial, and resurrection that Jonah really is. Could I get an amen? I wish I had a Sunday morning Bible reader up here. 
Amen. What a marvelous fulfillment of the type of Christ. Hey, friend, I want to tell you something today. God loves you just like you are. But Jesus died for you just like you are. The Holy Ghost will convict you. The Word of God already condemns you. It already indicts you. You don't have to go to hell. I said you don't have to go to hell. Oh, friend, I, 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 I probably I remember as a child, Brother Randy, as a child, I was burned, but for some hot liquid splashed on my stomach, and my mom had to bandage me and take me to the hospital and all that other good stuff. I'm better. It's okay. It's right here, and it's a long, 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 long time ago, but I can still remember the pain. I can still remember the searing heat. I can still remember, Brother Perry, the hurt and the agony of that, and you couldn't even touch it. I couldn't even imagine what it would be like to take my last breath and to leave this terrestrial ball and to wake up in a place called hell. I couldn't imagine what it would be like to live in a lake of fire. I can imagine Lake Blaylock. I can imagine Lake, uh, Lake Murray. I can imagine Lake Jocassi. I can imagine uh, uh, all the other lakes in our area. But can you imagine a lake of fire, a lake of fire, a lake of brimstone where souls that have rejected Christ will spend all of eternity. Friend, there's no escape from hell. There's no intermission from hell. There's no interlude from hell. If you die and go to hell, you'll be there forever and forever and forever to be brought up at the great white throne and then be cast alive into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and the devil himself. I'm so glad I'm not going. I'm so glad I'm saved. I'm so glad I'm washed in the blood. I'm so glad I've been born again. I'm so glad I know today that salvation is of the Lord. Amen. The severity of the distress. Look, if you will, look, if you will, in verse number three. For thou hast cast me. Watch this. You ain't going to believe this. Well, I'll tell you what let's do. Go back to chapter 1. Go back to chapter 1. Watch this. Go back to chapter 1. Look at verse 15. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Turn the page. Turn the page. Look, if you will, in verse number 3. For thou... Thou, wait a minute, it said the sailors did it, but watch how Jonah words it. For thou hadst cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Don't stop right there, look at verse 4. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again. Toward thy holy temple. Brother Galloway didn't see that either for a long time. In chapter 1, verse 15, the sailors are doing the casting. In chapter 2, he's cast into the sea. But Brother Ronnie Phelps, in chapter 2, verse number 4 here, he said, it's not just the sailors. Now stay with me, okay? It's not just the sea. It's not just the tempestuous waters. He said, I am cast out of your sight out of your sight. Did you know today that's what hell is? Did you know today that's where you are now? You're separated from a thrice holy God. You have no fellowship with him. You have no union with him. You have no communion with him. You have no friendship with him. If you're here, listen, are you with me to church? The sailors cast him. Miss, Miss Sheila, the sea received him, but then he gives all of it. He sums it all up. He said, I wasn't just cast by the sailors, and I wasn't just cast into the sea. I was cast out of your sight, out of your sight. What an illusion. What a reference to the state of lost sinners now. Not shall be, but now they are separated from God because of their sin. Amen. 
separated from God. Look at verse 4. I am cast out of thy sight. Out of thy sight. Could I tell you something? Right now you're already condemned. It's not that you're going to be condemned. You're condemned already. John 3.18. John 3.36. You're already condemned. But if you die in the shape you're in, and you wake up in the region of damnation that this Holy Bible calls the place of hell, if you wake up there, you're going to know exactly. Listen to me. I'm going to hurry up here. You're going to know exactly what Jonah's talking about. I am cast out of thy sight. Look at me. Look at me. Eternal separation from God who is love, who is life, who is light. Oh, hell must be a terrible place. Hell must be an awful place. You know what? The rich man, when he's in hell, he said, would you send Lazarus that he might dip the tip of his finger and cool my tongue for I'm tormenting this flame, one drop of water. Okay, would you send Lazarus that he may go to my five brethren and testify unto them. He didn't say anything about finding God. You know why? Because he couldn't find God down there. He's eternally separated from God. And I want to tell you, you can blame it on the sailors. You can blame it on the sea. But you know what Jonah said? God, what I'm suffering, I'm going through because you put me out of your sight. You put me out of your sight. There's such salvation tones in this chapter that folks have very rarely ever lifted them out. But that's what being lost is all about. That's what being consigned to hell is all about. That's what the lake of fire is all about. Separation. Separation, Brother Cam, from the very presence of God. My, my, my. What a terrible way to spend eternity. What a terrible way to exist. What a terrible way to live. You say, oh, I'm going to burn up. No, you're not. You've been made in the image of God. You're going to live forever. i tell you what I'd do. I'd run to this altar right now. I'd make sure I'm going to live, with, live forever with God in heaven and not in hell and not in the lake of fire because you're going to know separation. You're going to know separation. Can you imagine going to a place where there is no light? Could you imagine going to a place where there is no love? Could you imagine going to the place where there is no divine life? He said, you've cast me out of your presence, and if you die and go to hell, by the way, if you die and go to hell, there's nobody to blame but you. Right. Nobody to blame but you. You made the choice. You took that route. You pushed God away. You said no to Jesus Christ. You said no to the Holy Ghost. You trampled underfoot the blood of, of, of the everlasting covenant and done despite under the spirit of grace. I want to say it again. I'm talking to somebody. If you go to hell... If you die and go to hell, you're going to have to look yourself in the mirror and say, I have nobody to blame except myself. I'm up here preaching the truth today. Your Sunday school teacher gave you the truth. Your parents gave you the truth. Your Christian school gave you the truth. There's the truth all over America, all over Cherokee County, all over Spartanburg County. If you die in your sin, if you die in your rebellion, and you go to hell, Nobody's to blame but yourself. And I'm telling you, it's going to be separation from God. Look at verse number five. The waters come past me about. Watch this. This is strange. Even to the what? The soul. See? You see the overturns or overtones of salvation terminology here? He said, The waters come past me about, Brother Nathan, to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds, the seaweeds, the sea vegetation were wrapped about my head. Verse 6, I went down to the bottoms of the mountains, all the way down to Sheol. The earth with her bars eternally kept, but their bars was about me forever. Yet, here's the resurrection, thou hast brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. By the way, it seemed like it was going to be his permanent entombment, but the fish spit him out and brought him back. So there's resurrection. But I'm not preaching that today. I'm preaching the severity of the distress that Jonah was in. The billows. Look at verse 3. All your billows and all of your waves. 
And the sinner is in the same kind of situation, encompassed and surrounded by the waves and the billows of God's judgment and God's condemnation. We've watered it down so much. Yep. We failed to preach it so much. It's become nothing but a terrible place to tell somebody to go. Right. I wonder, I wonder if us Christians believe it anymore. I wonder if believers truly believe that people literally die and go to hell. I wonder, do you believe today that some of your family may wake up in the place called hell? And all the billows and all the waves of God's judgment and God's wrath will be flowing over them. Not for a year, Brother Stoltz, not for five years, not for ten years, but forever and forever and forever and forever and forever. And the only intermission that I personally know about is when God has the great white throne of Revelation 20 and the small and dead and that the, the sea and the grave gave up the dead, and hell gave up the dead which are in them, and they stand at the great white throne. He said, well, thank God to get out. Oh, no, that's when you get eternally condemned to the lake of fire. In other words, it's like this. Hell is the county jail. Stay with me. Hell is the, listen, listen to this. I've never preached this in a while. Hell is the county jail. The lake of fire is the final penitentiary. The lake of fire is the final penitentiary. We shouldn't want anybody to go. We ought to be praying that nobody goes. We ought to be witnessing. I wonder if anybody begging God for your kids. I wonder if anybody begging God for your grandchildren. I wonder anymore, and I'm serious, I wonder anymore do any of you parents even sit down and talk to your kids about heaven and hell. Do you even sit down and talk to them about their soul? Do you let them know that this is more, there's more to life than what this life is? There's an afterlife. There's a heaven to gain, and there's a hell to shun. Folks, I don't know whether or not he died. I don't know whether or not his body was separated from his soul. We're not going to argue that right now, but I do know this. Throughout this chapter, throughout this chapter, he shows us the distress of a lost soul, and that distress is the place called hell. And the good news of the gospel is, thank God you don't have to go. Thank God you don't have to go. And the good news of the gospel is that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. I want to show you something. I just thought of something. Go back to chapter 1. Watch this. Dr. Love, I never saw this. Go, go back to chapter 1. Look at verse 14. Watch this. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not what? Perish for this man's life. Wonder why they use that word. Wonder why they use that word. Because I'm telling you, throughout this chapter, you have great evangelistic preaching here. Don't let us perish. If you die without Jesus Christ and the blood applied, you're going to perish. And you're going to wake up in hell. You're going to remember on the February 28th of the year 2021, come on to the instruments, that on a Sunday morning, the preacher got up and preached about Jonah. The preacher got up and preached about the singularity of deliverance and the severity of the distress and told me I didn't have to go to hell. And told me I didn't have to go. And you don't. You ought to trust Christ today. You ought to take him as your Savior. You ought to make your calling and election sure. You ought to make sure before you leave this sanctuary, before you leave this sanctuary, you ought to make sure that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Let's pray. Father, what a great song they're singing, playing. Whoever's in this building, if they're not saved, I ask you, God, right now to finger around their heart. Show them their need of salvation. And let them know that salvation is of the Lord. And if they'll come to him and they'll trust him, 
and they'll accept him and they can be saved. They won't have to go to hell. Make it plain, make it real. Convict, draw whoever needs to be drawn. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're singing what number? Page 342.